So um, my name is Rob McAllister. Uh, you've already heard my voice. Um, I'm the head of customer success at Filtered. Um, hopefully everyone knows who Filtered are, considering you're probably on our email list to, to be signed up to this. So I'm not going to go into a big spiel about who we are and what we do. Um, but my role uh, at Filtered is to work with clients to deliver on their objectives. So that could be as simple as kind of launching Magpie in an organization and helping with the engagement, the positioning, to the reporting. Um, but my team is responsible for anything that is post-sales. So we get to deal with the really great bit. The contract is signed from a, from a client. They then get passed over to my team and we deliver on those contract terms and hopefully build a long lasting relationship. But really what we're really passionate about is understanding impact. And we don't want to kind of just work really hard to deliver some uh, a platform and a tool that nobody uses that doesn't really drive change within an organization. So um, we, we all are very passionate about kind of making sure that anything that we do has significant value to our client in an individual basis, but also to the business as a wider organization that we work with. And I'm joined by Ajay Jacob. Um, I'll let Ajay uh, introduce himself and give some context of Arcadis as well. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And hi, everyone. It's, uh, you know, thanks for making the time to, to join this, uh, despite the strange circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, like many of you, uh, maybe like many of you with kids, I'm, I'm still getting used to working with my three-year-old in the house. Um, so, so I apologize in advance if he does make a grand entrance at some point, like in the famous uh, BBC interview a few years ago. Um, you know, so as Rob said, I think it's a difficult time on, on the one hand, but it's also an important time, I think, in some ways to be having these kind of discussions around the role of workplace learning and technology, um, given that we're in this sort of VUCA um, world. Um, so, but, so just a brief introduction. My name is, um, is Ajay, and I'm uh, the content manager for our academy at Arcadis. And Arcadis, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is, is, a, is a sort of leading design and consultancy firm headquartered in the Netherlands. Um, but we have 27 of our colleagues, uh, 27,000 of our colleagues uh, located uh, in about 70 different countries across the globe. Um, so what I'd like to do briefly today is talk about the journey we're on in terms of bringing work and learning closer together. Um, and I realize given the time we may not have you know sort of time to go into too much detail but hopefully this is a useful starting point and we can then extend the conversation uh, via linkedin or or other channels sounds great and um thanks ajay and just on the working from home my, my wife is on maternity leave at the moment and i said to her between 11 and 12 can you not stream anything on netflix or iplayer so my internet is okay she's just decided to leave she's gone right i'm going out so um you know we all have to make sacrifices when we work remotely it's, it's kind of hilarious um, yeah <laughs> Um, so just to kind of go back to our subject here, what we're kind of discussing. So we're talking about in particular leadership development, digital transformation with AI and MS Teams. MS is Microsoft Teams, of course. Um, plenty of people will be using Teams for the first time, let's say this week or in the past couple of weeks. Um, but also some organizations have adopted Microsoft Teams um, a lot more. So wherever you are on that journey, whether you use Teams or another tool, um, we're really focused on leadership development and digital transformation throughout this. And we're gonna kind of give some context through that as we go. Um, Francesca Mantovani has, has asked us, uh, at least tell us what she is watching on Netflix. She's been watching Pandemic, which I would not advise uh, watching right now if you're concerned about uh, COVID-19, um, because it doesn't paint a very good picture, but it's very fascinating Netflix documentary. Yeah. Um, so with regard to leadership and uh, leadership development, digital transformation, Fujitsu did a study in 2017 that said 70% of organizations claim they lack the necessary digital skills to compete. Um, and based on kind of what we're seeing online, what we're seeing with, with kind of uh, clients and generally the kind of learning development world right now, it feels like that number may have decreased, but there's still quite a lot of lack of confidence in digital skills to kind of adapt to uh, the current situation, you know, being able to have to work remotely, collaborate remotely, and it's a real change of um, dynamic for a lot of people in their day-to-day -day lives. Capgemini also ran a study in 2017 that said that 54% of organizations agreed that their organization has lost competitive advantage because of a shortage of digital talent. And um, that, that study is still extremely good bit of research to be able to understand really where we are as uh, kind of, 
a global organization group of do we feel prepared for this digital transformation? Are we prepared right now to deal with this current situation and adapt our business um, capabilities? And the reason why leadership is so important and kind of digital transformation is because John Cotter has a fantastic uh, overview of this is from a HBR article he, he wrote. Um, and this was written in, in I think, in, in the early uh, part of this, this century. And change, by definition, requires creating a new system, which in turn always demands leadership. And um, that is, I think, paramount to the success of any change program, any digital transformation, is despite having really good technology, people are fundamental to the success of any change program whether that is a leader, that's an end user. Um, and what we're really starting to see now um, is, you know, people on the ground and the humans are going to be the real people that affect change within an organization, of course, but are going to be key to digital transformation as well. Because if the leadership understands and understand why this is such an important item, then there's going to be more impact within that business. Um, and City and Guilds, who are kind of one of the partners with, with Filtered, ran a study in 2019, so slightly more up to date. And when it comes to the actual learners, our end users, 41% of employees said they would value coaching or guidance on how to perform and communicate more effectively in an area of digital transformation. So, you know, not a majority, but a large proportion of people that were surveyed said that they need a little bit more support. And that digital transformation effort is needed to kind of build that confidence from the digital sphere. And again, a similar study, 33% of leaders feel they are well prepared to lead the digital skills agenda at their business. So two thirds of leaders um, that were surveyed did not feel prepared to lead digital skills agenda at their business. And like we say, we're kind of dealing with a lot of clients right now that are, are having to really fast forward their digital transformation and their remote working capabilities to their staff very, very quickly because this is a really un unexpected change. Um, so um, I'd be really interested just to, you know, if you were to think how, how would you rate yourselves? We won't ask anyone to put anything in chat on polls, but um, all of this, this content that we kind of have put together, Ajay and I delivered this at London Technologies in February last year, uh, sorry, last year, last month. Um, but, you know, it feels like even what we were talking now is more relevant than ever with regard to changing dynamic of how we all work. But actually, I'm going to pass over to you because um, we, we obviously work together on a project and kind of it's what we're going to be basing a lot of the conversation on. So it'd be fantastic for you to give us an overall overview of kind of uh, what you were trying to achieve um, with this project. Yeah, thanks, Rob. I, I think... Um so, so firstly, I think in terms of, of um, high level approach and philosophy um, for us, Arcadis, um, for us at Arcadis, sustainability is really at the core of who we are um, as a business. Um, and actually, um, one of the things that, that, that I said um, when, when we presented in London was that we were trying to take a similar sustainable approach to our learning technology. Um, and the question that we've been asking ourselves internally is how do we use what we already have to meet our learners where they already are. Um, and so that, that question has meant that we firstly, I think become a lot more conscious about our existing technology um, stack. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it, it's very common in large organizations for, you know, for, for nobody really to be aware of all the different technologies there are in use. Um, so it's, so it's really, I think, initially taking stock of, of, you know, we had a very cluttered learning um, sort of technology landscape. Um, so really just doing a, an audit, a, you know, just, you know, seeing everything that we had in place. Um, and then the second part to that is how do we become a bit, bit a lot more deliberate about any new technology that we're adding? Um, so not adding, you know, for the sake of adding it, um, but really making sure that it fits in within a sort of an ecosystem and that it's making sense um, because otherwise you know you what tends to happen is you, you try and streamline you decommission a few sort of legacy um, platforms uh, and then before you know it you're back up again at the same level um, so 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 really that's the kind of approach that we want to do to take um, and in terms of the program so so rob can i do, is it okay if i go ahead into the line management um, experience yeah perfect um, so it's in this context that, you know, the, so the second half of last year, we ran some experiments, um, starting with our line management, uh, line manager community, 
um, and and so we were we were building this um, this this program, um, and obviously the the design of it was was one part, but the delivery was was obviously the other side of that coin. Um, so we were looking at at both things um, very carefully, um, and the line management experience itself. Um, was strategically quite important to us as a business during this time of transformation. Um, and there's three main reasons why um, it was strategic. And I'll, I'll just mention those. Um, because firstly, there was a realization that our line managers are, you know, our manager community um, is pivotal to the success of our business and realizing our ambition to becoming an employer of choice and a, uh, a, you know, a best place to work for our colleagues. We also recognize that our managers are key um, in, in the sort of engagement, you know, of, of those they manage, right? So when it comes to driving a continuous learning culture, driving that behavior change, managers played a very, very important um, role. Um, so that's, that's something that we were very, uh, we, we were very aware of when, when designing this program for this, um, for this audience. Um, so the approach that we were taking for this line management experience is, is kind of twofold. Um, and the first one is, um, was co-creation. So what, what we did, what we wanted to do is really put our managers at the heart of the line management experience. Um, and, and we had a, um, an experiment, we call them the experimenter community. So these were actual line managers who were able to opt in to sort of be a sort of, um, you know, whether it's in the form of focus groups or um, early sort of adopters to try certain tools and technologies. They were very, very much a part of the creation process. So it's not something that we were trying to design in isolation and just do a big launch. Um, now this was, we were trying to take a very, a, a very different approach. Um, and so we had over 400 line managers sign up to be a part of this co-creation, which is really exciting for us. Um, and then the obviously the, the 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 related part to that is the continuous experimentation. Um, so we we were continuously experimenting with these experimenters um, to gauge their feedback and get ideas on um, on the impact um, and relevance um, you know for them. So we wanted to make sure that this was really designed and customized for their purposes. Um, so those yeah so those were our two main sort of um, I guess approaches. Um, and these, and here you can see some of the objectives of this line management experience. So, so we had, so initially, um, the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the strategic, the strategic importance, as I mentioned, and then the, the approach, which was the co-creation and, and experimentation. And these were, I guess you could call them our objectives in terms of what, what did success look like? Um, and these, I think will, will sort of, you know, maybe resonate with a lot of you. I mean, most learning programs have, have similar sort of objectives. I think the trick is how do you get there and how do you measure that? Um, and how do you drive that culture of learning along the way? Um, and that sort of, I guess, brings us to, uh, to Magpie and, and Teams. Um, so, um, but I'll let Rob go, go first in terms of telling the story from his end. Yeah, so obviously the, um, the the background to the project that Ajay just gone through is a really exciting project to work on. It's, uh, as we've said, leadership management capabilities is a, a key part of the business change that we feel at Filtered we can help organizations with. Um, and this pilot was uh, a fantastic example and experience for us to be part of um, with the objectives that Ajay has kind of outlined. So um, some of the things that we had, and we, we ran a pilot for a relatively short period, and the first thing that we achieved was really positive feedback. And, you know, Ajay, please um, interrupt me if you want to kind of add some Arcadis perspective on things here. Um, but some of the quotes that we had from managers was exceptionally positive. And this experience, you know, was based within teams. Um, and... Of the audience that we had, we had 71% of the audience were onboarded, so they completed our chat. If anyone is familiar with what Magpie looks like, there's an onboarding chat at the beginning. We ask you three questions, which then enable us to kind of deliver you your personalized recommendations. So 71% of people completed that chat, received their dashboard, and were able to access recommendations. We sent out a kind of impact survey at the very end of the pilot to gauge whether you know, like I said at the very beginning, part of customer success and our success metrics with a lot of our clients is really measuring what did we achieve 
and 80% of surveyed users spent more time on their development with access to, to Magpie. 70% of recommendations were marked useful. So anything that a user completes um, within our platform, we ask them to rate that on a kind of three three step basis. So did you find this useful? Did you know this already? Was this not useful? So this is our kind of feedback loop and obviously something being marked useful is a really positive indicator of a good recommendation. And then finally, 75% of users that we surveyed gave an example of learning transfer. So within our survey that we asked, we not only asked them whether they put something into practice, but to be able to give us an example of how they did that. So if you imagine that could be a, a TED talk about communication um, and how to communicate to a wider team. And then we had a learner give us an example of what the tips they took from that TED talk and how they applied that when they did their team meetings. So we had quite a good example here of learning transfer. And um, one of the big questions we get yeah, a lot is, is, you know, if yeah, we are, we are yeah. our, sorry, Ajay, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback just from your, um, your machine. Um, but obviously feel free to interrupt um, <laughs> just in case. Um, but yeah, we, we had a really good example of learning transfer. And one of the things that we get asked quite a lot is, do TED Talks transition into someone changing their behavior, someone actually impacting their work? Um, because we obviously curate TED, we think it's a fantastic resource. And we had some really tangible examples where people had been inspired by a certain video, inspired by a talk, and then very quickly made uh, a, a transfer of that knowledge into their day-to-day -day work. So before I go deeper into kind of chart and some other stuff, Ajay, was there anything you wanted to add um, on this kind of summary slide from your perspective? No, I think, yeah, I think you've covered most of the sort of um, um, sort of main sort of feedback that we got, Rob. Um, I mean, th there was there was a few other sort of learnings, I guess, from our side as well as the learners. And we can, um, I think there's some slides up ahead where we cover that. Um, but these, yeah, these were some of the main headlines. Cool. And so to give you a little bit of um, more depth to some of this analysis, um, and for those of you that haven't, uh, aren't a client with us or haven't necessarily ex seen the power of our reporting um, that we have from a filter perspective, um, is that uh, we can identify based on those chat questions where people are based. So we ask people where they were. Are you based in Asia? Are you based in the UK, Europe, Latin America? And then we can map um, the, the skills that they identified. So we can start to identify outliers. Um, so in Asia, we obviously had the most usage, but the, the kind of are self-aware and communicate were two skills that were really highly focused on by our users there. Whereas um, in other platforms or in other kind of uh, industries, sorry, it's a bit more dispersed. So you can really start to look at the, the skills framework and the skills that we're offering managers and how does that differentiate between what people need to focus on? Arcadis is a global organization, as Ajay has said, there's people all around the world. So the, the kind of results here started to identify different usage patterns and different trends. And um, in GEC, for example, the, the top skill to focus on was drive success, where the majority of other places communicate was the top skill. So you can start to see some um, cultural differences or locational differences based on skills that people want to access. We also looked at um, usage and relevant skill. And um, we identified based on usage, we, we, the beauty of kind of uh, this platform is nothing was mandatory, nothing was compulsory for people to attend. All continual based learning, go in here to self-develop. So you can start to understand where the skill gaps are because people are doing this off their own back. They're not being incentivized to do this and they're not being told to kind of, you must do this. Um, so you can start to see the skills that people want to focus on, but also where we have a really high relevance score. So we can say to, um, to Ajay and Arcadis as a team, lots of people are accessing a certain skill, but there's not enough really good quantity of, of actual materials that you have. So we can start to identify um, drive success, um, obviously really, really big um, usage volume here, similar to communicate, but we also have connect, which has a really high relevancy hasn't had that much usage so do we need to start promoting connect to more people is it a key skill as part of this management experience that we should try and utilize um, these findings 
You can also an, an, analyze providers, and this is what we did with um, Arcadis, is we looked at the content, we're, we're platform agnostic, at, at filtered, um, and we used a lot of um, curated assets that we've curated ourselves. Obviously, all of this was approved by Arcadis, so they're able to put their own filter on things and make sure that we haven't curated something that maybe isn't so relevant to their managers. managers. But what we, what we see, and we see this for all of our clients, is the usage volume for created content by the client is, is always the top provider. So Arcadis here, you can see usage volume is much higher than any other um, content provider. We know that the usage is always gonna be higher because there's that trust, there's that brand value, which we would all hope if we work in an organization um, that we are trusted to be able to give them learning. But you can start to then metric other providers as well. So all of the, the providers here that we used um, were, were to a small group. Um, so you can take these results with a pinch of salt, but you can start to identify if uh, we wanted to curate some content in future, maybe the Guardian isn't the best place to get some certain um, feedback. Whereas HBR, you can see it's had quite a lot of usage, but also the relevance score is really, really high. So we know for this content and for this group of users that we're going to go to in future hbr is a, is a potentially a really good resource but the, there was plenty of learnings and i don't want to go into too many you know too much details behind that of, of kind of what we achieved and the results that we learn um, and i think the most important thing really is for Ajay to take us through the kind of learner experience and how did we get those results and you know you found out the the why you've discovered the kind of what but kind of how did we do this um, so Ajay, I'll, I'll pass over to you yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, and and I, you know, so some of the sort of the topics um, and the skills that Rob was talking about obviously came out of a sort of a, a competency framework that we that we've sort of put together, and we worked quite closely with Filtered in, in terms of the mapping and getting some of those those resources in place. Um, and this was sort of quite early on in the process, so we didn't have a lot of that internal content built already. So actually, that was another area where we would where, where we could quite easily sort of pull in some content, um, you know, from the web, from from some of the other you know sort of sources that Rob's mentioned, um, to fill those gaps um, and to see what was working, what wasn't. But really, sort of what I wanted to do now was talk a little bit about you know what we were trying what we were trying to achieve um, by using sort of uh, Magpie in Teams. Um, and I think the main thing was to, as I mentioned before, build a, a really high quality, scalable and consistent experience for our, all our line managers. Um, so we wanted to be future focused in terms of looking at new technologies um, such as AI. Um, but at the same time, we did want to start small um, and take our, you know, take our learners on the journey. Um, so you know, really kind of using this sort of experimental group, using real managers, um, you know, using them to validate, uh, run these experiments um, and, and sort of learn from that and move on. And that was our approach. So, um, and it was also interesting, the context in which we ran these experiments at the time, we didn't have a single global LMS. So um, again, as I alluded to before, we had sort of multiple um, systems. So there were really sort of two main hypotheses that we were that we were looking to to test, um, and those were um, so the first one was Microsoft Teams will help us streamline that experience by having the the one place to go to, which is not something that we had in the past. Um, and then the second one was we would drive more engagement, given that it was more in the workflow as far as the line manager is concerned. Um, and because, you know, so by this time we had seen within the organization a shift towards Microsoft Teams. It, it was by no means, you know, sort of adopted across the organization, but people were starting to get familiar with it. And so therefore, um, in, autumn, immediately sort of almost straight away lowered the barrier um, for entry as far as learning was concerned. Um, so that's one of the things that we really wanted to try and leverage. Um, and Teams, you know, was on everybody's sort of la laptop or desktop, you know, so it wasn't sort of something new that we were bringing in. Um, so that was exciting. And so then sort of the next thing I want to talk about is this sort of omni-channel approach, which is, I think, really gets to the heart of what um, Magpie, I think, does really well. Um, because since we ran this experiment last year, um, we have seen, we've seen two things happen. We've seen even more of a shift towards teams 
Um, and I think the impending demise of things like Skype for Business has accelerated that shift. Um, that we're now at another point where I think companies are, are exploring. I saw a couple of folks already mentioned they've just made the move over to Teams. Um, so there's these certain points in time where you suddenly see a sort of a big migration. Um, so that's happened for us. And I think eventually we'll get to a point where it, it becomes really part of everyone's daily work. We're not there yet, but that's the direction it's going. Um, and we also now have a global LMS. Um, so this has changed the equation um, um, a, a little bit, um, but we were, we were very clear that the LMS was never going to be that sort of primary place we send learners to. Um, at best, it was going to be another channel with which we reach learners. Um, so, and so what do I mean by this omnichannel experience? So, I, it's, so it's really just trying to, you know, like I said before, reaching people where they are using tools that they're already using. Um, and I think this is where the flexible approach that, that Filtered has really comes into play. So when we initially launched this Magpie in Teams, we found that there were certain people from within the test group, the pilot, the experimental group, um, that weren't that comfortable with Teams. So Filtered were very quickly able to pivot and open a new channel. So whether that was a browser-based interface or you, you know, sending out emails a bit more, um, it was really sort of all these different channels, right? Um, and that's, it's something that we've, it's an idea we've borrowed from our, from colleagues in marketing. Some of you on the call will be quite familiar with it. Um, but how do you sort of broaden your reach um, and engage with that audience um, in a sort of, in a way that they're already comfortable with, um, rather than forcing them down a way that they're maybe not, you know, sort of used to. Um, so, so it was really kind of seeing, yeah, what works, what doesn't work. And ultimately what we're trying to do is seamlessly blend our learning offering or, or the experience in this case, the line management experience, blending it seamlessly into the work. Um, and, and one of the questions, you know, that, that we had, I think after the talk we did um, in London and also um, in the weeks, um, you know, sort of after that was where does the LMS fit in, right? Because that's always a sort of a, a big, it's a, a bit of a sensitive issue. Most companies have a large LMS, um, you know, so, so what role does it play? And, and for us, you know, so we, we know, even though we now have a global LMS, um, it, it's, it's it, like I said, it's not gonna be the primary place that we maybe send learners to. It is gonna be part of our ecosystem. Well, it is part of our ecosystem. Um, it's great for automating some of the admin and maybe even for structured learning paths. But from the point of view of performance support, um, it, it becomes fairly ineffective. And that's where Teams was exciting because it was scalable. Um, it was something, you know, from a learning standpoint, we knew that the real value is in the conversation, is in the sharing, is in the collaboration that Teams does really well. And that's what we were, I think, in some sense, looking to, to optimize for. Um, and, and so we've been talking, I know Rob doesn't like this phrase, but we've been talking about learning in the flow of work for a long time. Um, but I think another important factor for us was something I like to call learning at the speed of work. Um, and this was crucial because line managers, um, we're a consultancy based business. So there's, there's always sort of, you know, high, high billability targets and people are time poor. Um, but line managers in particular, are, are maybe our most time poor audience. So if we knew, so we knew that if we could engage them, uh, if we could engage this group, then the rest would almost be sort of comparatively easier. So it's really about, you know, how, yeah, how, how do we make sure that it's, it, it, it's, it's embedded in their flow of work, it's easy to share and distribute to their teams, um, and how do we make sure that it's, we're not, pulling them out, sending them off to somewhere else, and then maybe getting them lost in a whole array of sort of content choices. Um, but, you know, yeah, just making sure it's targeted, it's personalized, having that, ma that machine learning do some of the, the grunt work and, and really sort of surfacing the top two or three um, sort of, you know, pieces of content for a particular topic um, was a really powerful combination for us. So, so a lot of the, the feedback that we got was, ex it was exactly around that, oh, hey, I didn't know I could access learning in Teams. Um, and hey, this is like really, you know, sort of straightforward. I don't have to read a whole manual. 
Um, it's coming to me rather than me having to go looking for it. Um, and there was a lot of feedback, especially around, um, yes, this was really useful because we used this as a topic for our team meeting the other day, or I was able to quickly recommend it to, a, to, to my team, or I was, um, as a result of this experiment, we've had, we had feedback saying that they were more um, likely to make time for their own self-development. Because again, I think it, it was, the initial experience was, was intuitive, it was there, it was where they already were spending their time, and then it meant that they suddenly could, could access this just as they would access sort of, you know, any, any other productivity tool that, we, that they were using. So from that perspective, I think it was really powerful. And just to add on this uh, omni-channel experience, I think what was super powerful is that generally when we work with clients, we can send, you know, we're using a multitude of tools. So we could be using Yammer as the, the community. We could be using GoToMeeting for the webinar. We could then be using um, Skype for Business for a webinar as well or different calls and to be able to, you know, Teams is really feature rich. So being able to harness the ability to do a video call within Teams, it's saved there automatically within that team. So when anyone goes back to it, if they missed it, there's a big image saying, you know, you can you can re-record this. To then be able to send messaging within Teams to everybody very quickly, have that social element where someone could say, Ajay's seen a particular thing about leadership, for example, or teamwork, and he can share that article within this thread. Um, it becomes very, very powerful to have this kind of like ecosystem that can do lots of things. Um, we hosted our user guides, we hosted our FAQs, all within Teams as well, within the files element. So it became quite a neat way to host the learning experience um, rather than this kind of fragmented approach. So it's a, it was something that was, it was one of the earlier Teams experiments or, or projects that we've worked on. And it was quite enlightening to have all of this uh, ability to condense, I guess, the, the workflow or the kind of, um, the, the, mess, the need to go elsewhere into one kind of ecosystem, into one place, um, which I think really provided a powerful reference point to a lot of users as well. But Ajay, I think the, our next slide, we're going to go through kind of what we would have done differently. And I'll, I'll pass over to you just to kind of get an Arcadis uh, perspective. And I can maybe just give one, one or two points about um, from a filter too, but I'll let you go first. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think in terms of what we would have done differently, I think, you know, yeah, given that this was um, sort of, um, yeah, it's coming up to maybe nine months ago now. So obviously the, the, the landscapes changed quite a bit in that time. Um, but I think, um, yeah, if, if we were to run it again now, we would maybe look at making, uh, making it available to a slightly larger pilot group. Um, so initially, we, we, because we were running a series of these small experiments, we were, we were keeping the groups quite small. Um, and so we, we had about 100 people sort of sign up or, or we gave them access and they became like our first sort of guinea pigs. Um, so maybe looking to, to have a slightly a bigger group would have given us a larger, uh, you know, more meaningful data set. Um, it would all, also have been good to sort of have, and at the time we were still starting to build out our internal catalog. Um, and as Rob said, I mean, um, you know, learners are far more likely to, um, to access the internal learning compared to um, something from, from outside. Um, and so we, we, right, so now we have a bit more of that internal content. Um, so I think to have this more sort of a, a wider range of content for Magpie to work with would have been quite powerful because maybe initially people were just um, getting just TED Talks or you know, things from HBR, which are useful, but what they really wanted was maybe the Arcadis content and we have more of that now. So, so it's so it'll be interesting to see how, how um, you know, what the reaction is second time around. Um, and maybe just time as well. So maybe we should have, you know, we could have run it for a slightly longer time to measure sort of real sort of impact. Um, so I think those would be the, the, some of the key things that, that maybe we, we would have done differently. But I think it still taught us a lot of valuable lessons. And, you know, I think I, I'd like to just finish by saying, you know, we're still very much at the beginning of the journey, right? Um, we, we, we needed to ensure, from our point of view, we needed to ensure access first before we started to talk about measuring success. So because we were in a position where um, with multiple systems, you know, we, we just had to make sure it was a consistent experience first and that the, you know, people were able to 
to access learning wherever they are, whichever part of the world, whatever sort of role they were in, whatever, right? So, as, um, so that was our main, our, our first step. But really the combination of sort of um, curation and context um, was really sort of really important. And I think that's, that's where um, we found that this was, this was really quite valuable. Um, and for us in terms of, you know, next steps is we need to continue to listen. And I'd encourage you all to do the same, just to understand your learners. Um, we've been taking a design thinking approach, which has worked really well for us. Um, and perhaps it might be useful for some of you as well. Um, get, you know, get your learners involved in building the learner experience and continue to keep them at the center of your learning ecosystem um, would be, I think, some of my, my main sort of um, takeaways personally and, and, and some recommendations that I'd pass on. That's really That's great. Really great. Yeah. So much context then, Ajay. So I'm sure everyone will be really appreciative of that. Um, from a filter perspective, the kind of only thing I think on top of what Ajay has said about what we'd have done differently is um, we'd have done kind of uh, messaging via Teams itself. So we, the way that we actually onboarded people was by a combination of emails, um, but due to our development team kind of fast tracking um, some, some development, we're now able to send those onboarding notifications via Teams. So you can really make sure that when someone comes in, you can start to have this back and forth via a kind of light touch bot um, or kind of notification center where it will tell you how to use certain elements of the platform. Um, for example, the one in the middle here is a kind of nudge around the top three recommendations that someone may have based on their usage. Because um, for the purpose of the pilot, we were having to do everything manually, which um, is, is, is fine because it was a small group. So you could really have that one-to-one -one connection. But I think if we were to launch this to the entire 4,000, 5,000 managers that Arcadis has, to do that, obviously, um, and give that still personalized feel becomes a lot more difficult. So being able to use Teams and to be able to send out these notifications like this allow us to offer personalized recommendations at scale within Teams or within an email. Um, it depends on what the user would prefer. And like I say, this capability wasn't available within um, the, the filtered kind of offering a couple of months ago, but um, our development team have worked kind of tirelessly to get this out and um, we're able to kind of run these notifications within Teams itself. So it becomes quite a powerful all-inclusive solution because you obviously can run webinars, you can host files within Teams, but then you can also um, send notifications out as well. Um, we're, we're at time, so I wanted to just kind of ask if anyone does have any thoughts or questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, if anyone does want to read more about kind of um, our team's capabilities, in particular the screenshots that we've got here, um, there's, a, there's a link I'm going to put on the the slide here um, where you can find out some more and I'm pretty sure Sam will be sending out this link as a follow-up with the recording um, to kind of highlight what the capabilities are what we can do it will be a kind of an extension of some of the screenshots that you've seen here as well so you'll get a little bit more context um, but from my perspective Ajay it's been absolutely wonderful to kind of um, hear your thoughts and I think as well the expansive thoughts based on what we did uh, three or four weeks ago so it's really good to have that additional context from you and hopefully everybody on the call found that really valuable for your kind of openness and transparency to share the journey of where Arcadis are as well on this. Yeah thanks Rob uh, yeah it was great to have the conversation and thanks um, all of you for, for joining. Um, I, I hope that uh, yeah this, this, this journey will be an exciting one in the meantime stay safe and healthy and looking forward to continuing the conversation. We don't seem to have any um, sort of deep questions yet, but if anyone does, um, please feel free to just pop them in. We'll kind of, we'll stay open for 30 seconds more, let's say, and if we, we have nothing in, we'll um, call it a day and let everybody get back to their, um, their houses because only one person was working in the office. So you can, you know, get back to making a cup of tea with using your own mugs and, and all sorts of exciting things. So um, yeah, it's been great. And Ajay, like I say, we're really grateful um, for you taking the time out, especially because I assume Arcadis has been quite disrupted with uh, with everything going on as, as kind of lots for other businesses. So yeah, Jill's saying not for long, she'll be, she'll be working remotely soon. So, um, but best of luck with that, Jill. Um, yeah. Get, get back, back okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, 
we've got no questions so thank you everybody and um have a wonderful afternoon and a recording will be sent around if you wanted to recap anything ajay's on linkedin uh, as am i and um, so if you do have any questions feel free to fire them over and we'll do our very best to answer them yeah cool thank, thank you very you much everyone bye-bye everyone bye-bye